So let's start the next part of uh, part two, Nika's uh, tutorial. <clears throat> okay. Uh, thanks for coming back. So hopefully I didn't scare you or bore you, or maybe now you're sitting here regretting, like maybe you skipped the last session, you're regretting, oh no, why did I come in? It just seems like I shouldn't have been here. Well, you're stuck here, sorry. But thanks for coming back. Um, okay, so I feel like I'm seeing mostly faces that were here. If you weren't here, we talked about different paradigms of learning. And now we just started talking about uh, sort of the min-max theorem in zero-sum games. Uh, so let me, we went through this slide, so this is probably a good place to start again. Um, kind of, uh, I, I also got a question during the, the break. So I think um, for those of you who haven't seen this before, maybe another uh, a place to pay attention to is that, uh, what is it that each player is doing? So we talked about zero sum games and each player is picking a distribution over actions. So if I go back to the model of a game, I have this game matrix, row player, column players, each row and each column are uh, these, we call them actions or pure strategies. And essentially each player has to now pick a distribution over its rows or columns. So that's an important aspect of talking about this min max and max min, and especially if you want them to be equivalent, as we said in a celebrated uh, von Neumann's min max theorem. So we ended the last uh, talk by just kind of looking at this min max theorem and asking, first of all, what is it saying and when is it true? And I uh, said that at the very least, we don't, uh, okay. This slide doesn't tell you anything about um, infinite matrices or whether or not for infinite matrices, this min max holds. That's something we're going to talk about uh, briefly uh, in a little bit. But before we do that, um, it's good to really think about why should even the min max theorem hold even for finite games? So not for these really weird corner cases, but for the most natural, small, plain games that you can think about. Why should it hold? And I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about this, although you have probably seen uh, something like this, even maybe in the previous tutorials or in the courses that you've taken. So there's two directions in the min-max theorem, and you were just talking, it's always uh, takes a second to realize which one is the easy direction. Um, one is this one, which essentially says that Whoever goes second is better at doing their job than if they had to go first. Kind of like the way to think about it is that the person going second um, knows what their, uh, can, can, can curate the response to whatever the other player had done. So now their response is very, very well curated. And because of that, they do a better job. So if the maximizer, maximizer goes second, uh, he can make the value larger than if he were to go first. And the same, if the minimizer goes second, he can make the value smaller than if he had to go first. So this part of the min max theorem is true just by understanding what you're giving up, um, uh, curating your response to something very specific rather than trying to cover all of your bases if you are gonna go first. Now, the difficult part is realizing that uh, the, the reverse direction holds. And the reverse direction, if you want to think about it, is that you're giving up the chance of going second. And essentially, you're almost like as if you're committing to something, not knowing what would have been the responses. So in itself has something very robust built into it, that you don't know what kind of responses you would have seen, but you still want to do well. And this is where the connection sort of to online learning uh, comes through. In a beautiful paper on observation, uh, but it's, it's been shown that essentially online learnability and min-max are both about interactions with an adversary. And at least for finite games, one way that you could have proved the reverse direction of this claim 
is to use a no regret algorithm or ver or two no regret algorithms. Let me talk about the version where essentially what you're doing is you take one player, player one, we are telling them that they need to be a no regret algorithm. What that means is that the <clears throat> probability distributions are producing these PTs at every time step, they're producing something new. And if I look at the end of time and I want to know if they regretted not having committed to some P from the beginning, that P, they had very little regret. This regret would have gone to zero, this vanishing regret. So this is what I'm asking player one to do. And then for player two, there are many different versions of this. You can also ask them to be no regret, but I'd actually rather ask them to be something that's much simpler, which is the best responder. So they can even see the PT at this current time step and they're always best responding to it. Now, I'm not saying that I'm changing the min-max theorem to now hold in a repeated way. No, I'm saying that I can get this repeated interaction to prove the min-max theorem. And how I would do it is that, I'm not gonna show you the proof, is to say that actually, literally this, this kind of the regret here is not having known what to commit to. And it's very similar to saying that if you switch your min and max, your regret there would have come here. And as long as you have a no regret algorithm, you're going to get this inequality to hold at the tighter and tighter um, inequality until your regret is exactly zero and then this is gonna hold uh, the way you want it. What this is saying is that uh, essentially the average, if I run this game infinitely long, the average strategies that will come out of this are in fact min-max strategies. There are the type of strategies that you could have committed to not having cared about what people are going to do, okay? This is a high level idea. Um, of course, it's talked a lot more about actually what happens to, I think, PT and QT itself, but we are ignoring all of that. We're just proving them in max here. So, yeah. So is, is this uh, something that's good from a strong duality of programming? They're very connected. So it's definitely a duality proof. Uh, Min-max theorem, um, duality, they're all highly, highly connected to each other. And uh, no regret, learning, um, lack of approachability, a bunch, bunch of others also are different ways of sort of addressing the same concepts. So they're all highly related. Okay. Um, so if I write such a thing for you, the next thing you're gonna ask is, well, it seems like online learning or online learnability um, has some role to play when it comes to the definition of an equilibrium. What is that role? Is it that anytime you can have an online algorithm, you prove that a min-max theorem exists um, just because you can ask one of the players to play an online algorithm? That's the question we're going to answer briefly. Um, by talking about the role of Lillison dimension and role of online learning in particular here. Because remember, we wanna talk about adversaries. So the very first question is, is online learnability a sufficient condition for min-max theorem to hold? And the reason you might believe this uh, is because, oops, because essentially the only thing here I did was to say that let player one play an online algorithm and especially an online algorithm for deciding these PTs. So it feels like what I told you essentially is um, saying that any online algorithm would have been good enough. Anything that makes an online algorithm work is good enough. So, so but, one question is, uh, in the previous slide, uh, using online learnability to show the min max, you are using, you do Jensen somewhere, like to, to, like to, to for, you know, for, for what you have on the bottom left there, mm -hmm. you have a sum of losses. Mm -hmm. You want to put the sum inside the loss. Mm -hmm. You really use Jensen. So this proof uh, uses a convex concavity of L. That is linear. So it's even. Okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, L is expectation yeah. of TNQ. So for your more general question, though, uh, the question mm -hmm. is yeah, do you need this multilinearity or convexity uh, or you probably. Ah, 
Okay, so I mean, the way I define the max theorem for finite for for a game for finite games is that the expectation itself is linearizing this problem. But there's another way I would have I could have talked about uh, min max theorem, which would have been about sort of pure I, maybe I, I don't want to call it pure strategy, but about points like x and y. Not uh, these are not necessarily representative of um, um, a point in a like probability distributions. And in that case, then what that L of those would have been would have been important. And um, there's there's an assumption that is convex in one and concave in another. That's usually the general form of min max theorem written for these arbitrary uh, spaces. So I thought if I simplified this already for you guys, so we are in the linear world dealing with the expectations, um, and sort of so this is already kind of structured. Um, so I'm talking about the min max in games. So you, you want to talk about the min max in general games? Uh, zero sum games. Zero, zero sum games, but, but potentially infinity sums. Uh, just understand that means that if it has in, uh, infinite size in every round, I submit the uh, infinite. Uh, uh, a numerable vector so, that is the probability I mean, vector. I, I think this is your question, which is one of the subtleties I was going to mention. Um, I'm asking you to give me a probability distribution for infinitely many rows. And how would you represent that? That's that's is itself a little bit problematic. Let me not answer this yet, because there are some other subtleties that I need to tell you, and then I'll give you one solution, a statement of the solution that fixes both your issue and other issues. But that, that, is, that is an issue. Um, um, let, let me give one other comment about this, um, which is that I could have, I'm interested in the, this value rather than the actual strategies. So I could have replaced this max with a soup and then with an n. In fact, a lot of the things I'm going to talk about from now on, especially when we start en entering the infinite games, are about the soup n rather than maximum. And that by itself should tell you something because maybe you have a sequence of probability distributions that have a certain property and um, they're sort of easier to talk about than just probability distributions over infinite spaces. Okay, so there are already really good questions coming in, but I want to put my own question forward as well, which is that, is online learning sufficient? And there are a couple of reasons that it's not. One is that games and game theory in general require the mixed strategies to be probability distributions over the actions. So it's important that it's a probability distribution over the rows. If I'm playing uh, rock, paper, scissors with you, it's important that what you do is also rock, paper, scissors. If I enter a game and I think that I'm playing rock, paper, scissors and you bring a tank, Maybe you'll win, but that wasn't the, the sort of the contract we made. So <laughs> that's actually not true for the way I define learning. Um, for online learning, I actually allowed you to do whatever you want. Okay. Um, if you thought that a tank was necessary, you could have used it. And there was nothing to stop you from that. This is a subtle point. Um, Let's go back. This is this is the little the exact slide that I had for online learning before. Wait, uh, I'm confused. Sorry. <laughs> uh, what do we mean that we do not know the actions that we will play? How then I play? So, uh, let me let me actually give you an example here. Um, for games, it's important. You know the action set and you play only on that. No, you cannot invent another action. For learning, you can invent hypotheses, which refer to actions. And here is, so this, this is the slide. And I want you to focus on three aspects of this. And hopefully it's clear what the three are. I feel like the, in this light, uh, the colors are a little bit different. Okay, so you have to focus here, here, and here. Okay, the first two places you're focusing, uh, I defined a function class H that was going to be what you competed with. But I never forced you to play any function from that class. 
Specifically, I use FT rather than HT to emphasize the fact that this doesn't have to come from your class. This is what I mean that you could have invented any function here you want. It wasn't one of the rows in what I offered you. Now, there are these proper learning algorithms, proper online learning, and we call them proper if FD had to belong to the set page. So really the question that you have to answer if you want online learning to be sufficient for midnight theorem is whether there, there are online learning algorithms that first are proper and second, are characterized, the regret is characterized by or upper bounded just by the low sum dimension again. Not by size of the class, not by some other combinatorial dimension, but by the little sum dimension. Why do we care about proper now? I, there was a question earlier, uh, last uh, talk, which said, what, what, what about, what, what is this random thing? We were talking about how your FT could be a random, uh, could have been chosen at random. So now if you have a proper algorithm and you chose FT at random, that's exactly the same as having chosen a row or a distribution over your rows where the rows refer to those hypotheses. So now an online algorithm at every step is literally taking a probability distribution over its rows. Okay, the way that I define the, and now I've changed the simple of my algorithm, I still, I didn't have time to check the simpler standard. If one of you knows, tell me, otherwise I'll have to check it later. Um, the algorithm that I told you that kind of inductively does the little sum dimension calculation. Um, the way so I, someone mean, from the audience says standard. Standard, okay, that's what I thought. Okay, yeah. thanks. Uh, I think that's what I had in the last one. I just like <laughs> hallucinated simple. And it's simple, it's more standard, okay. Um, the the simple optimal algorithm, the way we defined it at least, uh, it wasn't obvious that it was proper. Why wasn't it obvious that it was proper? First of all, it didn't really choose a hypothesis. If I go back here, what it was choosing um, was how to label something. This y hat, this was the label that it was suggesting. And um, there is no guarantee that there is a hypothesis that would have matched this for every x. At least it doesn't come with that guarantee. And because of that, maybe it's not obvious here, but because of that, this is written in a different language. At least there is no obvious reason that <clears throat> SOA should be <clears throat> a, a proper algorithm. So, but the nice thing about this, and I had promised you that I will have some quite recent results, is that that's been resolved. And the standard optimal algorithm can be implemented as a proper learning algorithm with finite support. And in fact, we kind of know what its support is as a function of its VC dimension and the little sum dimension of the class. Um, so what that is saying is that, um, in fact, the simple optimal algorithm you could think about it that at every time it's using majority vote of only a few of these uh, rows. Majority vote meaning that it's going to have it in its support. And uh, that allows us to now say that because that simple optimal algorithm was proper and its regret was still defined by just like something like almost little so dimension divided by T square root of it. Now, finiteness of Lillison dimension is going to be sufficient for my min max theorem to hold. I still have no proof of it being necessary, but it's sufficient because what I can do is to take this algorithm and plug it into the first player's algorithm. And then the second player is going to best respond. And that's going to give me the min max theorem holder. Is it possible that it's necessary or the it? Is it possible that it's necessary? We actually know the characterization. It's the next slide. So I will talk about that in a few minutes. Any questions about this before I talk about necessity? Right. So what, what, uh, this finite, what does this finite support mean here? Like, this is an algorithm, and what is the finite support here? Oh, what I mean is that the probability distribution that it's using at every time step. Uh -huh. So the game it has infinitely many rows, but actually, it only the probability distribution has support only on finitely many of it. Okay. 
May, maybe I will repeat what you said, but uh, that, that would be verified that I understood correctly. So the algorithm, what we'll do is that we will have all the hypotheses, that is the distributions that we would play. We will follow the simple optimal algorithm just to play for this round. And we know that just in the limit, uh, we will get the min max uh, theorem because the regret uh, will vanish. Did they get correctly? Um. Oh. It's important that I, I'm not sure if you mentioned the plugging in. So the this is a this is an important aspect of it. So you can't just plug it in without uh, also making sure that the adversary is best responding. Yeah, right. And the, the, he, yeah, and so all that you need to do is the... you plug in that algorithm that is proper, any algorithm that's proper and only depends on the Lewis dimension, this regret here. And that SOA is one example. Very and the, he will respond with a hypothesis uh, with a distribution or a is that who the adversary? Uh, yeah, yeah, the adversary, the, the two, the player two. It's not adversary; it's the player two. Of the game. Player two never needs to actually respond with a because it's, it's player two. You can come up with uh, deterministic actions as a right, response. Right. So the player two is not very important. It's just the fact that it's not uh, it's not passive; it has to actually do something. Here, the PT is a distribution and it has finite support. That's the only claim. Okay, other questions? Uh, I think we were here. Okay, so Samina asked, and I mean, it is the next question you should ask. Uh, is this on the mention, is finiteness necessary? I think this is really interesting, which is that surprisingly it's not. Um, here I have a class of infinite little sum dimension. It's the same class we talked before. This example is actually from uh, communication with Steve Haneke, uh, where uh, you have these intervals from an integer to twice the integer. And we talked about the fact that this has an infinite little sum dimension. But actually, the min max and maximum value here are both zero. I uh, didn't have time to draw this as much, but uh, kind of like uh, at a high level, what you would have done here is let's say, as the learner, what you need to do is to decide a distribution over these funky intervals. And um, and what you want is, let's say that you're trying to minimize uh, that uh, one. So one way to think about it is that doesn't matter and the adversary has some distribution over the instances uh, and instances are here. Uh, you can always sort of cut this somewhere and put your interval here so that there is very little um, probability distribution in this corner. And you can move this farther and farther and farther, or, or it doesn't matter have to be farther. You could just move it anywhere to make sure that it's capturing uh, a small amount of the distribution. So that's kind of what, what you would do if you were the learner. Um, what you do if you were, an ad, uh, you were the adversary is uh, also try to have, I didn't work this out exactly, but you would sort of pick a distribution that any um, that in any interval of a to two a, it has uh, it's it's sort of it's yeah okay so its density is uh, kind of like falling in these intervals a to two a, so that uh, you are not going to be uh, giving a lot of room to the learner to actually capture this. So I didn't work this out, so I have to work this out. But I think this is kind of the overall idea of why you could show that both the min max and max min are going in the limit, the soup inf and n soup is actually going to be zero because you can um, make sure that you do not essentially capture any of the distribution in the active part of your interval um, either way. So, that's an example of why infinite little sum dimension is not necessary. And you can work this out uh, at home. But I wanted to highlight 
an interesting aspect of this, which I promised last, uh, I actually gave you a pointer in the last, uh, last talk, um, which is how come it's not sufficient? Like if I think about that infinite tree that I made, it should be quite easy to show that anytime I have this infinite tree, like I, I grew a tree down to infinity, I could have con continued growing it. I shouldn't have min max theorem because of very similar idea that we had, which was uh, kind of, you, you know what the adversary has to do to make sure that the, um, there is a gap between the average regret, there is a gap between min, min max and max min. Then intuition here is that um, there's a difference between growing a tree to infinity and having infinitely large trees. So to capture that, actually this paper uh, comes up with a different notion of, uh, uh, of complexity. And that notion is going to characterize, it's, it's definitely related to the Lewis dimensions, uh, but not the same. And it's going to characterize when min max and max min hold for zero one uh, valued games. So what is this? This claim is that, let me take any game matrix. This is infinitely large game matrix. If I can have a sub game of it, where the sub game, the, the rows can be sort of rearranged so that it's triangular. If I can do that, um, and I can create this for an infinitely large sub matrix that has this property, then the min max theorem is not going to hold. And that's the only condition that will make min max theorem not holding. So existence of an infinite sub game that is triangular. Here is the interesting part. I mean, actually all of it is interesting, but here's the subtle part. As we discussed, there's two ways to make little sun dimension infinite. One was to take a single tree and grow it to infinity. And the other was to keep coming up with bigger and bigger and bigger trees. Not that the bigger and bigger and bigger trees don't exactly follow this type of sub game, because this is a sub game that you have to, you, the, the fact that it's a sub game, like every sub game of it is, um, has this triangular behavior, is something that means that you should have been able to grow it to infinity. The, but there are classes that little sum dimension is infinite, not because of the sub game, but because there are, there are larger and larger and larger and larger little sum dimension trees. So this, this not notion of uh, um, no, so, sorry, the, the infinite sub game is exactly trying to differentiate these two from each other. In one, we have the min max theorem holding, in the other, we don't have the min max theorem holding. Yeah, think of it as saying that in one, there's always a sub game that throws that we call it triangular for all D, and the other, there's actually an infinite D. I think that, uh, that can be thought about it as the same, but let me just say that this is not going to be the same as low sum dimension. Um, there is this other dimension called the threshold dimension, which is essentially this, but it doesn't have to, it, it can again be infinite in two different ways. Uh, it doesn't have to be like a sub game. And uh, what you're saying, I think, would be the equivalent, the analogous to that. And what we know is that that dimension, little sum dimension, are within um, double exponentially within each other. So if one is the important thing is that if one is finite, the other is finite. But um, the actual numerical thing doesn't translate directly. Yeah. Uh, if I look about a random matrices, uh, it's a question. Uh, if I have a random matrix where each entry uh, would be with probably one cup plus one and the other minus one, do we know if uh, uh, zero or one, it doesn't matter. Uh, do we know if uh, a random infinite matrix will have a, a malicious triangular uh, matrix? Okay, I have to think about this, but this seems like a question you can answer with stochastic, like, like it's just like yeah, a yeah. process. It feels like it should, if you are infinitely growing it, you should be able to have an infinite sub game, but I might be wrong. Not something I can answer no, right. above my head, but uh, this is a question you need to answer. Like the better or not, with some constant 
Uh, I don't know if it has to be, I guess, uh, when you're talking about random matrices, uh, I guess you want to say with some probability, probability yeah. that's holding one out, right? Yeah. It feels like it should, because you're allowing it to grow, in, like you're allowing the matrix to grow infinitely, so you should be able to, you should be able to show that it's infinite. Yeah, counting should allow you to do that. But again, I'm, I'm not going to claim that, but I think you can do it. Now. Okay, questions about this? Is there any hope to extend this to games that are not zero one? I will, I, maybe it's next slide. No, it's not the next slide. Uh, I will mention that. Actually, Kosis has done some work on that. Uh, we don't know a characterization, we know one set. But before I get to that, um, we saw a lot of different results. And I want to take an opportunity to actually think about them beyond the mathematical thing. What we have noticed is that, at a very minimum, we've noticed is that learnability is very sensitive to adversarial assumptions and to the particular notion of adversarial assumption. Because we know that zero sum and online learning are very similar to each other, but there's still a difference in what is characterizing them. And of course, offline and online are quite different from each other, and there is a huge gap between the two. So at the very least, what we know is that this is, we need to really think deeply about our adversarial assumptions. But I think one other thing that I would take from the last two rows especially is that it feels like the, the particular definition of adversary is uh, really important in the sense that some of these results, especially the little sum dimension, appears to be brittle. Because even if you don't change the adversary, it's still adversary, but you're changing sort of the context of what you're thinking about, you change the characterization. And in the next part of this talk, I'm going to dig deeper here and try to open this online learning and really look at how brittle is this? And are we sort of closer if we try to avoid those brittle cases? Are we closer to offline learning or are we somewhere else? So that's a quick takeaway. The other thing is that there are a bunch of things I did not mention. This is a very interesting area. And that's real valued functions and real valued like games. For the first two for uh, adversarial, um, for, for stochastic and adversarial, we actually have a pretty good understanding of all of that. Uh, there are several different ways of characterizing them. So there is um, there is Rademacher complexity and sequential Rademacher complexity. There is um, pseudo dimension as a counterpart to weak dimension. There are a bunch of other things. There's fat shattering. There, there's a whole lot of different things, but these two essentially are what characterize uh, those processes. Um, so we act, at least understand them really well. For min max. Uh, there are sufficient conditions, as I said, that Kosis has worked on with uh, one of his students. No, I don't know. Uh, he's, coming later this he's coming later in the semester. Uh, and uh, but it's not a necessary um, type of it's, it's not necessary. So it's still not characterization. It's much harder to think about characterization for real value functions, especially because the margin conditions start mattering. But it's through something that looks like sequential path shadow. Um, that's it for this part. Are there questions before I move on to this kind of looking at these brittle examples a little bit more? Okay. So here is, uh, as I told you, this kind of the huge gap between offline and online, and then also the differences between online and min max. Really, <clears throat> I encourage us to really think more deeply about the differences between these two. Are we actually in one world or the other? They both of them seem sort of, um, maybe one is very idealistic, the other is like super pessimistic way of uh, uh, looking at um, reality. So can we have a slightly more realist point of view? And this is something that algorithm design has done for decades now, in the sense that we, are, we love talking about worst case adversaries, we love talking about sort of average case and then everything is beautiful, but we also want to talk about what happens in between those. Like do these models actually nicely transition to one another or not? And that's what's called smooth analysis. One of the ways to do this is at least smooth analysis framework. Um, a little bit of an overview, um, beautiful, very impactful work, an idea from uh, 
Spielman and Tang about that started with sort of simplex and kind of understanding, oh, we know simplex doesn't do well for worst case adversaries, but does it do well if I were to perturb my adversary a little bit? So smooth analysis, the idea is that the adversary chooses an instance and then the nature perturbs it slightly, like adds a Gaussian noise to it. And then the goal is, for instance, that either an expectation or with high probability over these perturbations, you want to <coughs> give a good, a good performance guarantee. And this has been repeated in uh, many different applications. The modern perspective on these uh, Gaussian perturbations are that maybe it's not Gaussian necessarily. Actually, the adversary is choosing <coughs> The adversary is choosing a distribution over instances, and this distribution has to be sufficiently anti-concentrated. There was a question earlier about thinking about distributions in the worst case, and we were saying that they could be sort of focused on one thing. And here we are saying that they had to be sort of dispersed and anti-concentrated. And this is a really useful framework when we suspect that there is something, the worst case instances are brittle. And ideally, what we want to be able to get is that essentially we're going to get the same performance guarantees as an average case, as in when things came from a distribution, uh, but for the case of adversaries that have been smoothed. So what does this look like? Um, let me skip this since we are a bit short of time. Um, what does a smooth analysis perspective on online learning actually look like? Well. We're going to start with the model we had, which was I have a world, I have a learner, and I have an adversary. But now my adversary is not an adversary, and it's not the world. It's a combination of the two. What it's doing is that at every time, it's picking a distribution. And that distribution, uh, he could have picked it knowing everything about the algorithm and the history. Again, if I allow the distribution to be super focused on one point, this is just the adversarial view of the world. But I'm going to change this by saying that the smooth, the sigma smooth distribution is a distribution that cannot focus on any one point. In fact, its max density has to be something like one over sigma times the uniform density over the domain, something like this, a, a uniform upper bound on the max density that you can provide. And we are doing it with comparison to a uniform distribution. You could do it many different ways, actually. And then what you're asking is, again, the same thing. You know, what happens to the regret? In fact, and then this is the more modern perspective of what I was saying is the Gaussian perspective, which is that the adversary would have chosen an instance and then the instance would have some Gaussian noise would have perturbed it. Okay. And in this language, this was uh, both of them were actually introduced by Shidaran and Rockland and Tawari in 2011. So I like this formulation because it's not about a specific noise model, it's much more general. And what we are hoping is that we are gonna get vanishing regret and uh, sort of uh, get it with not something that depends on little sum dimension anymore, right? We wanna avoid the, the dependence on little sum dimension, which was really large, even as soon as I put a threshold in, it would have jumped to infinity for more. So to recall, I can actually write the worst case and sort of the best case in terms of two different languages of uh, amount of smoothness. So the worst case is if I have no smoothness at all. And a very good case, it's not the offline, it's actually a special type of offline, it's the uniform case where the distribution itself was uniform, uh, refers to sigma being one. And we know that uh, this is the high characterization with the little sum dimension, this is an upper bound actually. Uh, only, the only claim here is that it's an upper bound. And we know that sort of the way that we look at the first row is to interpret it as an impossibility result because thresholds are so common in machine learning. That's how we distinguish between good and bad, zero, one, allowed, not allowed. And essentially, little sum dimension jumps to infinity whenever we do that. So what we want is to avoid this situation. And a nice result uh, here um, with collaboration, in collaboration with Timur of Karna and my student Abhishek, Abhishek Shetty, is uh, looking at what the regret bounds here would look like for, uh, for smooth analysis. So what we've shown is that even in presence of an adaptive adversary that picks the sigma you know, uh, smooth distribution based on what's happened in the past, 
you can still get regret that looks so much more like the offline learning setting. It's characterized only by VC dimension and not by level zone dimension. Of course, it's going to have a limit, a very tiny dependence logarithmic on the size of the noise. This is something that you cannot avoid because when the noise is zero, you should uh, go back to the little dimension. So this is the overview of what I'm going to talk about. Are there any questions about the setup? Other questions? Yeah, so if the sigma is one of the, so there, there's a bunch of things that I haven't covered here. Sigma one over t is probably fine. You don't want it to be one over two to the t for sure. Um, I don't want it to be tiny. I think sigma one over t might be actually okay. Uh, two to the t is definitely essentially made uh, nothing, no assumption. Uh, I'm not sure if one over t is okay or not. So there's some log of things that I haven't put here. So, um, but I think one over t is fine. So since I'm talking about pseudo dimension, it's binary value, but everything I say holds in the real value with a pseudo dimension instead of binary, with instead of pseudo dimension. So it's actually it is. Um, the neat thing here is that we actually really do a reduction to the offline setting. So whatever would have worked out for that class in the offline setting on the uniform distribution is actually the thing that comes in. Okay. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about this. Uh, and I want to just build some intuition here. So what are the challenges? Because this is going to build more intuition about the challenges of the adversarial setting. And also, why smoothness helps? Question? Yeah, yeah. About the, the bound. Uh, just as a mathematical curiosity, could someone uh, prove uh, that when, uh, when I have the limit that sigma goes to, uh, to zero, then the VC dimension uh, will become uh, the uh, little stone uh, dimension? No, so it's, okay, so you're asking a good question, but the VC dimension and little stone dimension is not the right way to frame it. VC dimension and little stone dimension are only about hypothesis classes. They have nothing built into them. So <clears throat> we do have this characterization <clears throat> actually tells us something about little stone dimension in terms of VC dimension and the size of the hype, size of the domain, okay? And uh, this, I mean, it comes out of this characterization. It wasn't known before. And uh, this log of one over sigma, you can think about it as the effective size of the domain. Um, another way to say this is that you could have asked this question about um, something like Rademacher complexity. And uh, if you wanna talk about that, we can talk about it offline. It's some, some ongoing work that I have in my group. Okay, so I wanted to start kind of thinking about why did the stochastic case work here and then what's failing. So the reason the stochastic, like one reason that the stochastic setting is working is that uh, I have something defined as a net. A net is an approximation of my hypothesis class and it's a finite approximation of it. So I replace my hypothesis class, which is potentially infinite with a finite hypothesis class where each hypothesis has a proxy. So like this grid is the proxies of my hypothesis. And I want something about this net. It has to be a good net. And good net is one that it doesn't have a lot of weight between, and like not many points fall between any uh, hypothesis and its proxy. So that sort of measured over the distribution, the a function is close to its proxy. That's what you want from a net. And that's something you can easily get. Um, and it's kind of for this distribution looks like this, you know, uh, a hypothesis uh, here, its proxy is going to be there. And sort of if there is less than epsilon in that total thing, um, a function is going to be close to its hypothesis measured over a distribution. And the reason sort of the offline setting works is that um, not only in expectation, this is small, what that means is that 
because I have IID assumption on the adversary, the world is throwing uh, things at random in, into this distribution. I have this anti-concentration property about each of these little bits in my net. What this means is that IIDness is uh, not allowing the adversary or the world to put too many points here. So they are close to each other, both in expectation and in reality after things have been realized. So the thing that makes the adversary to be really powerful is literally not having this anti-concentration. The fact that an adversary can always focus arbitrarily in one area because it can correlate the future non-trivially with the past, okay? So that's what we are trying to avoid when we don't have IID assumption, a more powerful adversary would definitely be able to correlate. The question we are wondering here is that, of course, I have this like sigma smooth assumption. None of my distributions are focused in one place. So I can make a net that is reasonable. But because the adversary is adaptive, because this is a long-term strategy, maybe the adversary in long-term can still sort of focus in one area. So is it that correlations across time are actually messing up my anti-concentration properties? That's literally the question we have to answer, which is that, how do we preserve anti-concentration from one step to the next, to the next, to the next, over t time steps, even when those distributions themselves were adaptive to each other? Okay. And here the challenge is that the literal correlations across time, the fact that a new distribution was chosen after I, real, I drew, drew some instances from the previous, so they are highly correlated still. So. We actually introduced a toolbox here that can be used not just in online learning, but can be used in talking about any adaptive adversary in smooth analysis. And I'm going to just talk a little bit about that toolbox. The most important tool in there is a type of probability coupling. <clears throat> a probability coupling is just a fancy way of talking about the joint distribution, distribution. but a joint distribution <clears throat> that has, sorry, but a joint distribution that has some nice property embedded into it uh, between the sort of each draw of X and Z. Um, the idea that we are going to use is that I have an adversary that's in smooth analysis that's generating these instances. Can I couple this adversary with a fully stochastic distribution? Because if I could couple it, and I have some nice uh, sort of behavior between this, this coupling, essentially maybe I can replace an adversary with a, with a fully stochastic world. And we show that that's doable. All you have to do is to actually increase your set of points that you're going to generate. So for any adaptive sequence of T distributions that are sigma smooth, there is a coupling between the adaptive adversary, adversary sequence, and the uniform distribution in the sense that I can, with high probability, T draws from my adaptive adversary is going to be included in the set of T times K draws for, uh, from a uniform distribution, where K is about one over sigma, okay? So the nice property of a coupling here is really this monotonicity is the fact that by I'm producing a little bit more random variables, but I'm making sure that my, this set of random variables includes all the ones that would have been really produced. Why is this a good property? It's good property is because first of all, I'm coupling it with uniform distribution. Uniform distribution is like the model distribution for anti-concentration. It's not concentrated. It's like the least concentrated that you can figure, find out. So if the uniform distribution is not concentrated and my real set of variables is a subset of it, then this couldn't have been too concentrated either at a slightly different time, time scale. But by coupling it to the uniform distribution, I'm borrowing uh, those properties of a uniform distribution. So this allows me to say that if that area between H and its H proxy didn't include too many Xs from the adversary, it doesn't because it doesn't include too many Zs from the uniform distribution. 
And essentially, all I've done is that um, I have replaced an adaptive smooth adver adversary in my analysis, not in actual algorithm and actual life, but in my analysis with a, a fully stochastic adversary on a slightly different time scale. Now, how does this work together? Just, we're gonna see this at very high level. This is gonna allow us to do the following. I choose my net. The net is usually defined over a distribution and I don't know what distribution. So I'm gonna just define it based on uniform, which was sort of my um, basis of defining what a smooth distribution looks like. Then what I have to use algorithmically is I'm just going to run an algorithm for the worst case regret, like for the worst case uh, instances on the net only, okay? I'm going to ignore all the other hypotheses. So this is the algorithm. Now, as I said, uh, we chose this from the uniform distribution because if you choose it from the uniform distribution, the fact that it's uh, you're working with sigma smooth distribution actually makes it nice. In expectation, you don't have a lot of weight there. And uh, in expectation, you can show that for any for a fixed um, sort of cell here, for a fixed H and H proxy, um, you, sh you have a pretty low expectation of having points in there. That's just a sigma smoothness working with a net. The thing you want, however, is something not just about the expectation of a single cell, but an expectation of everything. In fact, this includes a switch between a min and max, but another way to think about it is that I want to talk about what is my approximation error, which is kind of like the max number of points in any of those little holes. And I can think about this, I can just ignore those random variables and introduce the uniform random variables using my um, coupling. Because that set inclusion is something that works nicely with this summation here. And once I do this, I'm back in the world with uniform distribution. In the uniform distribution, uh, things work out nicely with just VC dimension alone and not the lowest dimension. That's it. So here, what we really see is that there is a toolbox that we can replace T interactions with an adaptive smooth adversary with that of a uniform, um, with slightly longer time scale, but of a uniform uh, world. And the nice thing is that it allows us to borrow not just analysis, but also algorithms from the stochastic world if we choose to. This is a very general model. I gave you an example from online learning to highlight especially the brittleness of online learning characterization, but it works in general for many other settings. And I think the way you want to think about it is that we are getting the ideal result, which is to get essentially the same performance as in the offline setting as you would in the online setting with just a little bit of smoothing. Or essentially this coupling that I talked about can get rid of the worst part of an uh, worst part of an adversary and bring you back to something that looks a lot more like an offline work or a lot, a lot more like it's fully stochastic work. This gives us a recipe. You can actually apply this recipe to generally many different problems. You could think about it as, um, what is the recipe? You just take your problem that you want. Uh, it has an offline version and online version. You solve the problem for the uniform distribution. It's usually the easiest thing you can do. Once you do that, you isolate where you use anti-concentration. Those are usually things that respond well to set inclusion. Once you identify them, in all of those steps, you apply a coupling and replace um, your sort of adaptively generated random variables with uniformly generated random variables slightly more often. And then you bring it back. Once you do that, you're done. You'll come back and continue the rest of the analysis. And you continue the rest of the analysis by sort of having accounted for the uniform distribution on a slightly different time scale. And as an example, not only this works in online learning, we've also applied it to a bunch of other online problems or problems that aren't necessarily online, but use the same min-max idea to solve the problem statement. So online problems, like for example, online learning, online discrepancy, data-driven algorithm design, but there are problems like differential privacy that really use min-max formulation to their advantage, and we can sort of apply the same ideas there as well. So kind of to wrap up the first part of the um, today, last hour and now, 
is that we saw that learnability is very sensitive to the exact adversarial assumptions we are making. Um, but it's that sensitivity is also partly brittle. And to really identify that brittleness, instead of using worst case analysis, we use beyond worst case analysis. Okay, that's it for today. As I promised you, I was very much wishfully thinking that I'm going to finish this part today, which I didn't. So the plan for tomorrow is I will talk about the computational aspects and I'll start here. But I'll talk about it very briefly because otherwise we're not going to get to the other stuff. And then we'll talk about uh, more generally non-zero sum games. I'm more generally thinking about general sort of strategic behavior, and then later collaboration. I'm here. It's like we have three minutes or something, right? Yep. I, okay. I'm here for more questions if you have. And uh, yes, question. Okay. Uh, yeah. I just very nice pieces of smooth analysis. It's really great. Um, just out of curiosity, is it? It seems very sensitive to the uniform sample. Is that the correct uh, interpretation that you really need? Uh, no. So the way we wrote it was for uniform because it just made that's the way that uh, historically people define mod modern perspective on smooth analysis. You can essentially repeat this as long as you have a reference distribution. So if I fix a reference distribution and minus some really weird corner cases, if I fix the reference distribution, um, then and tell you that you're allowed only distributions that are multiplicatively at most this much larger everywhere point wise than this reference distribution, then you can repeat everything I said and you can. Just change the coupling so that you're coupling it with the reference distribution rather than coupling it with the uniform distribution. Does that make sense? Let's say that like you thought Gaussian distribution right. was the right one. What what I what I'm trying to understand is that you might say that well I'm going to use the uniform distribution, but there might be better uh, distribution that you can use so that your regret becomes lower. Uh, right, so and it's a little bit unfair because yeah. I could have done the following. I could have said that so uniform is reasonable at the same time. In the sense that let me say that I made an assumption by saying that actually this distribution is only supported on five items. Now all of a sudden I went from something that this little sun dimension was crazy high to something that's Described on two to the five many different functions, so it's it's a bit unfair to take advantage of smooth analysis in that way, and that's why it's usually referred to a distribution that it itself has a reasonable performance. But it's, it's usually you, you don't make um, lower bound assumptions; you just make higher uh, upper bound assumptions that are. Uh, Either uniform or Gaussian or something that's kind of more reasonable because otherwise you're there are tricks that you can just like Perfect. make your problem just too easy and Perfect. you don't want to abuse that. Are there other questions? I mean, I'm curious what you would say, you know, the next uh, section. Are you going to cover it tomorrow or? Uh... I'm going to cover it tomorrow. So I had planned the next section to actually be relatively short. Um... I was uh, not going to change the model. So for those of you coming back, uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit more um, about bunch of things that are about really computational and algorithmic aspect of still online learning and the next, um, not, not, not the stochastic setting. And kind of like what you're going to talk about is, uh, first of all, what are the algorithms? And I'm going to give you a very brief statement of these because I don't want to get into it and other people have covered a bunch of these. Um, and sort of uh, one example of a combinatorial structure that allows for efficient computation. And then I'll tell you a couple open problems. Let me tell you some of the open problems right now so I don't have to tell them tomorrow. One open problem here is that I talked about smooth analysis. It's a version of online learning, but a little bit better than worst case. And I told you that we can always borrow algorithms from the offline case. Sometimes the algorithms that we are borrowing from the offline case aren't efficient. 
For example, the algorithm that I just gave you with that algorithm running on the net is uh, really inefficient. The net is exponentially sized. So how do you actually design an algorithm that uses the fact that your adversary is better than worst case, but also computationally tries to use toolboxes that were developed for offline optimization, not toolboxes that were developed for online optimization. That's a general open problem uh, for online learning in particular. Another uh, type of open problem, because if I tell you enough, maybe I don't have to do this tomorrow, is um, sort of, thanks, Kostas, you gave me the permission. Uh, I'll, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll take five minutes. I just wanted to ask a question about the previous slide. Okay. Oh, this is just the. Uh, just... I know, but I thought, so did you talk about an adaptive adversary versus a stochastic adversary? Yeah. Sort of something in, in the middle of Libya's adversary. Good. Uh, um, essentially, you can ignore Oblivious adversary. So there's two ways to think about this. The result I gave you for Oblivious ad for adaptive adversaries says that adaptivity, that coupling, is, is coupling an adaptive sequence with something that's non-adaptive. Uh -huh. So that's essentially saying that even in smooth analysis, you can ignore oblivious adversaries. And we actually, before we came up with this coupling, we treated adaptive, oblivious adversaries separately because adaptive adversaries were just too difficult. And uh, you can get actually similar results. So I think it really talks about this, the strength of the adaptive adversary results rather than oblivious adversaries being a special thing. Um, but for this purpose, we can essentially ignore it. Um, while I'm not going to abuse the time, I um, perhaps just show you a little bit here because we talked about some characterizations of statistical characterizations of when can I learn in the offline setting, when can I learn in the online setting, when does the min max theorem hold. And now you can also ask them computationally um, when can I have a computationally efficient algorithm to achieve off online learning? And uh, may maybe perhaps to also find uh, something that's approximately close to a min-max um, equilibrium. And uh, there, we don't have a characterization here. There are some results for very specifically structured uh, settings. Uh, so if you have like a linear function in small dimensions, uh, Vasilis and uh, Kostas have a result about if sort of the Maybe the rows are large, but there's few columns. Um, in general, we need some assumptions because there is an interesting result by Hazan and Koren that says that even if I gave you an algorithm for offline optimization, just for minimization, for example, or just for maximization, you can't do them in max efficiently. And not only they say it for online learning, but their lower bound is interesting in the sense that it also applies to actually min max uh, in a game. And the thing that I'm going to maybe, if I have time, just, uh, just show is that there is a different dimension that's still not a characterization, but it's a bigger way of thinking about it, where it's still about the game matrix and how, um, how uh, expressive the game matrix is. And uh, that is going to be at least the best known result we know in terms of getting efficient online algorithms. And what that looks like is saying that I take a game matrix. It's not about the size of the game matrix. It's about the number of rows that I need to include in, my, in some collection so that every two row looks different. So if this is very small, um, you, of course, if sort of Y was small, this would have been small. You just include all of your, uh, your columns. But even if your Y is large, sometimes you can come up with a very few columns that essentially distinguish between any two rows. And if you have that, you can get algorithms out of that kind of a structure. And uh, I'm not gonna go into the, any of this detail. In fact, I just wanted to show this because maybe tomorrow I'll come back and use this structure and still skip this section so I don't have to um, talk too much about computation. There is a, a lot of stuff beyond this tutorial as well that. Oh. Maybe let's, uh, let's continue about to tomorrow. Uh, so when you go too much of yeah, that. I just wanted to uh, maybe show some, uh, sorry, some references that I thought. Okay. I don't want people to miss the references. Sorry, I don't know what my computer is. Oh, crazy. <laughs>
Um, and these are references that, since I'm skipping this section, they're also interesting. Some of them are by actually people who are here in the semester as well uh, about sort of how to not just think about statistical stuff, but also the computational aspect of everything we talked about. And uh, that's it. Thank you for the extra. <laughs> Okay, I'm here if you have more questions. Otherwise, hopefully I'll see you guys tomorrow afternoon. And